Welcome to our Play Tectonic Notes. This is day one, and this is Mr. Rattoon. If you are in Mr. Phillips' class, uh, we actually flip our days around so we don't do the exact same labs on the same day. So by flipping our notes, it allows us to do different labs at different times um, because we share equipment. So this is my Play Tectonics day one. This might be your Play Tectonics day two. So we're going to begin today by talking about the Continental Drift Theory. Now, when we talk about a continental drift theory, we're going to start by talking about the history of the theory. Have many of you guys ever heard of this theory, continental drift theory? You probably brought it up in elementary school at some point in time, and you may have talked about it in the sixth grade with uh, Mrs. Mialda and Mrs. McDonald. Now, the history of this plate tectonics theory it, it came from a belief that the continents have not always been fixed in their present position. And... The, this idea that they weren't always in this fixed position actually came up a long time ago, well, well before the 20th century. In fact, the Dutch map maker, Abram Othelius, first suggested this notion as early as 1596. This is one of the first recorded um, times that someone actually questioned whether the continents were in a fixed position or not. And Edward Seuss, in 1885, um, he was a geologist, and he actually found the same rock formations along several southern hemisphere continents. So people were looking at maps. People were finding geology clues that suggested maybe these continents weren't always where they are now. So what is the continental drift theory? It's a, it's a pretty basic theory. It basically states that the continents have moved horizontally to their current location. So they're not going up and down um, at least not in great, great um, strides or in great distances. They may move up or down a little bit as they're um, plowing through the ocean. But, but it was the idea that the continents literally plowed through the oceans, much like a, an icebreaker would plow through the snow, moving it off to the sides. Um, early geologists thought that maybe these oceans moved. And we're going to take a look at some of the evidence to look at why people would think that the continents were actually moving. Because if you look outside your window today or if you walk outside, it doesn't look like they're moving. You know, even if you've been around the Earth as long as I've been around, it doesn't look like the continents are moving. So why did geologists think this? And that's what we're going to talk about today. First of all, there's this guy named Wagner. Alfred Wagner. You might look at it and say, well, doesn't it say Wagner? Well, he was German, so we're, we're going to pronounce it Wagner, just like the Volkswagen. So, in, in, this theory, in his theory, Wagner stated that at one time, all land was one. All the continents were connected, and he called the supercontinent Pangaea. Pangaea basically is translated to meaning all land or all earth. And here's a picture of Wagner. And Wagner proposed the theory of continental drift back in 1915. And let's take a look at some of his history. Wagner was a very smart guy. He actually got his doctorate in 1904 in astronomy from the University of Berlin. Berlin. And he later became a meteorologist and an amateur geologist. Now, some people look at this and, how did, and ask, why did he get his doctorate in astronomy when he was a meteorologist? You've got to remember, back in these early days, 1904, there was no weather. Um, well, there is weather, but there's no weatherman. You, you look on the TV now and you see the weather and you see all these satellites. None of that existed. It wasn't until about World War I that scientists first really thought about predicting the weather and looking at weather patterns and fronts and trying to, you know, have a forecast. You know, nowadays it's pretty common to look at the weather and trying to figure out what it's going to be like seven days from now. They could barely tell what it was going to be like the next day or two days. And especially during World War I, um, the, the generals, the people in charge of the armies, they needed to know what the weather was going to be like to know whether or not they would order, you know, a front to move forward or um, to hold their ground and not move forward in the war. So in 1915, Wagner, he wrote and published a book called The Origins of Continents and Oceans. And it was in this book that he actually proposed the idea that the continents moved. So what he was suggesting that all these continents, and you can see the continents here. You got North America, Asia, South America, Africa, India, Antarctica, Australia. You can see they're all connected. And it's kind of interesting because India, especially India, is not where it's located today. And Antarctica, you can see where it is. You can see where Australia is. So the continents are kind of in their current location, but yet they've moved and twisted as they've moved over the years. 
So here's just another look at it. And you can actually see it was surrounded by a giant ocean, Panthalassa. And if you look at Panthalassa, it's Greek, and it basically means all sea. So there is a Pangaea, meaning all earth or all land, and there is a Panthalassa, which was a giant ocean surrounding this giant landmass. But over time, something happened, and Pangaea broke up. And this was not the first idea. Um, later on, scientists started looking for evidence, and they found evidence, and there's theories out there that Pangaea was not the first supercontinent. There were supercontinents before that, such as Rodinia was the supercontinent before Pangaea. And there's this theory called the rebound theory, which says that about every 200, 250 million years or so, all the continents come together and they form a, a, a Pangaea, an all-Earth. And then eventually they break up again and this, this just repeats itself time and time again. Now, Pangaea was surrounded by a great ocean called Panthalassa. Again, meaning all ocean or all sea. And Wagner thought Pangaea broke up into two pieces about 200 million years ago. And Laurasia was what he called the, um, the Northern Hemisphere supercontinent now. So Pangaea broke into two pieces. Laurasia was in the North and Gondwanaland was in the Southern Hemisphere. And so here you can see Laurasia and Gondwanaland. And you can see that eventually it broke up. And you can see this outline, it says a triple um, junction right here. Um, so it says triple junction right here. And when we look at that triple junction, it happened right here. And what happens with a triple junction is the first you're going to start getting this lifting up. And eventually it's going to split into three pieces. And it's kind of interesting how this works is it typically happens at 120. Nature loves the 120 degree angle. And eventually one of those junctions tend to fail, but the other two form... Um, actually work and they split apart and what happens is you have an ocean forming here and if this is South America and if this is Africa right here we know that eventually oops, sorry about that we know that eventually what ocean formed in between here the Atlantic Ocean now the two pieces again broke into uh, present-day land masses so these two pieces, Pangaea broke into two pieces. These two pieces broke into the present day land ma masses and they moved to where they are occupied today. So you can see where everything moved. You can see where they are today and this is actually a projection of what scientists theorize might happen 50 million years from now. And here's just an animation of how things move. So it kind of happens fast, uh, but you can definitely, if you look in the bottom screen, watch India as it moves up because we'll be talking about that later in our notes. You can see where everything moves. So India is kind of like a speed demon in there where it just really took off and it seems like it moved faster than some of the other continents. Um, this one doesn't seem to be working here. Um, usually it goes through the different time periods as well. And Wagner also said in his theory that the continents are still moving today, that um, we're still moving. Now, Wagner's evidence included things such as the apparent fit of the coastlines of North America and Africa and South America and Africa. So if you've ever looked at a map, a world map, and if you've ever thought to yourself, golly, those continents look like they're pieces of a puzzle. It looks like they could fit together. Well, Wagner used that evidence to help support his theory. He also found the Glossopteris fern fossil. This is a fossil that was found on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean and in South America and Africa. And this this fern fossil was too large and, and probably wouldn't have been able to survive a trip across the Atlantic Ocean. And this evidence was first brought to light by Edward Seuss. You notice something here? Wagner is using evidence that other people came up with. You might think, well, that's rotten of Wagner, but that's what science is about. Science is always about standing on the shoulders of those who came before you, taking what they've learned and taking it to the next level. Here's a mesosaurus. This is an interesting um, situation. And so you see the picture of the mesosaurus. Let me back up and put those down. So the mesosaurus is almost like a crocodilian type animal. It was a reptile, but it was a freshwater reptile. And it was found again on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. And this is interesting because if, if, it's, if it's a freshwater reptile, how can it be found on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, which is salty? So again, this later would lead scientists to conclude that, well, maybe the continents were once together, which meant 
that they had to move, in other words, continental drifting, they had to drift to their current locations. Other pieces of evidence, such as relative dating, compared fossils of organisms now extinct on continents on the west side of the Atlantic Ocean and those on the east side of the Atlantic Ocean. And that's your Mesosaurus right here, as well as some other fossils that Wagner used as evidence. He also used ancient climate clues on both sides of the Atlantic um, Ocean. For example, glacier striations in Africa. Wait, wait, wait. Did you just say glacier? Did I just say glacier striations in Africa? How do you get glaciers in Africa where it's so hot today? Well, maybe at one point in time, Africa wasn't where it is today. And you actually found these striations not only in Africa, but in places like India, which are pretty close to being on the equator. You also had coal deposits in Antarctica, which is very abnormal, because if you know Antarctica today, it's frozen. It, it's all ice. How do you get coal? Remember, coal comes from swamp plants that have died, and they built up huge layers, and these layers were compressed into coal. How do you get coal deposits in a cold place like Antarctica? Well, maybe Antarctica was not always where it is today. So when we look through here, and you can pause and rewind this video. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But you can actually see where scientists believe, based on evidence, where they believe the continents have moved from. So you can see at one point in time, Antarctica was on the equator. So here we can take a look at all the different types of fossil evidence you see. The Glossopteris, the Mesosaurus, um, you got the Listosaurus. All these, help, all these were used by Wagner to kind of piece Pangaea together. However, there was a problem. Wagner lacked the hard evidence. Well, some of the geologists, especially geologists in the Southern Hemisphere, they really appreciated Wagner uh, and what he was proposing. Because you, you found a lot of the evidence in the Southern Hemisphere. But a lot of the geologists in the Northern Hemisphere, they, they couldn't accept it. Some could. Um, but a lot of them couldn't accept it. It was just too great of an idea. And that's what science is a lot about. When, if you're going to propose a really grand idea like this, like the continents are moving, you really need some strong evidence. So there were some skeptics out there. And he, Wagner lacked the hard evidence. R remember what I said? He, he basically said that the continents plow their way through the oceans. And, and people just said, no, that can't happen. It, it's impossible. And it is impossible. And we found that out later on. But because he lacked that hard evidence, people didn't really appreciate what he was proposing, and they didn't give him credit for it, and it was not widely accepted. And again, the big thing is he couldn't explain the mechanics. He couldn't explain how the continents move. And to be honest with you, Wagner really didn't think that was his problem. Wagner found all the evidence. He put all the pieces together. It was like a puzzle, and he found all the pieces. He put all the pieces together, and he, he felt that it was other people's, I you know, problem. He felt that other people should be trying to figure out how. He just knew that it happened. It's, it's kind of like if you're trying to solve a murder mystery. You know how it happened. Uh, or you, you, you have all the evidence. You know who did it, but just trying to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Sometimes that's the hardest thing. And here it is too. Trying to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that yes, these continents are moving. And until someone could ex actually explain how they could move, you know, Wagner wasn't going to be fully accepted. Unfortunately, and here you can see a picture of Wagner. Remember I said he was a meteorologist, right? Well, because of these reasons um, that I mentioned before that he couldn't explain the hard evidence, he was ridiculed. And unfortunately, because Wagner was a meteorologist, he actually worked as a meteorologist. And Wagner actually died in 1930 during an exhibition in Greenland. And he was up there, he was actually setting up weather stations. And remember, this is back in uh, the 1930s, so you, you didn't necessarily have the big snow machines. You didn't have all, you know, the helicopters, things like we have nowadays. So you basically got around from weather station to weather station to weather station with a dog sled. So it may take you two, three days to go from one station to the next. And he actually got called, um, caught out in a storm, and um, him and his Inuit guide actually froze to death, and they died. And unfortunately, Wagner died... Um, with the idea or with the feelings that his, his theory of continental drift was not going to be widely accepted. And eventually we're going to learn later on in these notes that his theory was greatly accepted and it's actually known as one of the pivotal theories in science today. So now the concept of continental drift. It refused to die. 
So it was always out there. It wasn't widely accepted, but it was out there, and people talked about it. So the fit of the continents on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, they would always remind scientists that, yeah, Wagner had this idea. Well, what do you think about this idea? And it wasn't until later on that more information was found. It's almost as if Wagner was born, you know, 30 years too early. If he would have done the same work 30 years later, he probably would have been accepted pretty quickly. But technology was not around, or technology was around, but the technology needed to really prove his idea beyond a reasonable doubt was probably about 30 years away from um, being discovered. So this ends day one note. Again, if you're in Mr. Phillips' class, this might be your day two note. And we'll get into the next day's notes in our next video. So as always, if you have any questions about these videos, um, just ask. Ask when we're in class. Thank you.